today on AVG Pro, we're going to take a crack at deciphering an alien language found within the depths of the original Commander Keen trilogy, known as the Standard Galactic Alphabet. Now, anyone who's played the Commander Keen games will undoubtedly remember various signs found throughout with strange symbols on them. Well, these signs do actually have words hidden on them. Now, now, obviously in today's day and age of the internet, we could decipher all of these signs and text in short order, as there's decoding keys everywhere online. But where's the fun in that? Again, the whole point of ADG Pro is to have fun figuring stuff like this out for ourselves, and to show a process by which it would be possible. So, let's get to it. First though, let's quickly answer a question one of my Patreon supporters, Alex, had about this language, where she asks, with Keen being the source of the early industry meme, the Dopefish, has the standard galactic alphabet been referenced in other games beyond the Keen series? Well, I looked into this as best as I could, given that this is something that would be difficult to notice if you're not specifically looking for it, and I was able to pull up two references. One is in the DOS game Strife, where one of the textures a fair distance into the game contains a few characters worth, though the more prominent reference, believe it or not, is Minecraft, where it's used in enchanting tables to describe each of your enchanting options. Though when you actually translate these, they're mm, kind of gibberish. Well, at least they're made of real words. Anyways, before we can start properly deciphering this, we need to figure out how best to go about it. And something very pertinent about this made-up language is in the name. Right here in the game itself, right near the start of the first episode, we see a message saying that it's too bad we cannot read the standard galactic alphabet. As in, it's not really a made-up language, rather it's just an alphabet of characters. Thus, one assumption we can make right off the bat is that we're probably dealing with real words, just simply with all the various glyphs swapped out with new ones. Now that should make things at least a little bit easier. Unfortunately, the first episode of Commander Keen really doesn't have much of the alphabet in it. In fact, only 15 glyphs appear in the entire thing, meaning if we're just switching out English letters for other symbols, the first part of the trilogy only shows us just over half of what's possible. Thus, if we really gonna decipher this thing, we, we gotta see more of it. <laughs> now, once we get to episode two, however, the language starts making a considerably more prominent appearance, with all kinds of words spelled out everywhere. Yet, despite this, only 22 letters are used throughout the entire episode, meaning even if we decipher these all, we still won't have details on four of the letters. But at this point, that's probably better than nothing, so let's see if we can figure some of this out. One of the biggest clues we're going to see right off the bat as we're playing through episode 2 is that there's a total of 8 places on Earth we need to save from the Vorticons, and the names of these places are revealed in plain English in our pop-up menu as we rescue them. Those locations being London, Cairo, Sydney, New York, Paris, Rome, Moscow, and Washington, D.C. In fact, let's see if any of these city names are being spelled out at all. Now take London, for instance. The word London is six letters long, but only actually has four different letters, with the letters O and N right next to each other twice. Now in this particular level here, we're clearly rescuing London, given that we get a display monitor showing Big Ben, albeit it's dark in the gameplay here, plus once we clear the level, London is added to our list of cities saved. However, we can see directly above this machine a huge sign with two words on it. Now the second word is six letters long, only has four different letters, and there's a couple pairs of the same two letters right next to each other. If we make this letter O and this letter N, and then make this one L and this one D, that technically works. Heck, it even partially deciphers the word above to some degree. Furthermore, looking back at the map, we see that same word, which we're assuming is London, right here next to the level we completed to rescue London. This means after we complete a level, even if we didn't catch a glimpse of the sign up top, we can still confirm back outside after we get the name of the place we rescued. So, armed with the knowledge that each city we need to save is spelled out on the maps and the levels, this allows us to decode a pretty sizable chunk of the alphabet as we save those cities. In fact, we can decipher a total of 15 letters of the alphabet just by matching up all of these locations. So just to make sure we catch them all, here's Cairo, then Sydney, New York, Paris, Rome, Moscow, and finally, Washington DC. Which is just DC, but that's okay. We can also now start taking a stab at some of the other messages found throughout the levels. Again, keeping in mind, we're still going to be missing four letters by the end of episode two. 
Now these signs show up around every gun power-up in pretty much all of the episodes of the game, and given the letters we've been able to figure out so far, these signs decode into this. Now also note that whatever that last word is, the missing character is also the same character at the start of the first word, and it has to be a letter we haven't figured out yet. Now of those letters, the only one which makes an actual word is the letter T, to spell neat, which in turn creates a situation where the first word can only logically be missing the letter H to make the word this, meaning these signs around this gun states this is neat. Now let's go back to those big signs for a minute. Now every one of them has a word above the location being targeted, and given the letters we now have decoded, we can see the word is nearly complete. But what the heck is the missing letter? Well, if we read through the story of the game, we find out that the Vorticons are using a weapon known as the Tantalus Ray. So yeah, that's clearly a U that we're missing there. Actually, one word that's been staring us in the face for a while now has been at the end of every level on a sign which, given the letters we know, currently reads E something IT. I think it's safe to assume that the missing letter is an X to make for an exit sign. In fact, these were in the first episode too, along with these little signs scattered around, which, given what we know about the alphabet now, they just simply read die. In fact, the only other bit of galactic text in the first episode that might help us out here is where you find the pogo stick. Now, given what we know of the language up to this point, we can translate almost the entire thing except for the very first character, which is clearly a B. Thus, the sign reads, Behold, the Holy Pogo Stick, revealing that there is actually a divine blessing upon that metal pole Keen's been jumping around with. So, we're up to 20 characters now, and the only ones still missing should be pretty obvious when we finally encounter them, although we can decipher plenty of things just with the characters we have. For instance, this little sign on the main map of Episode 2 reads, Blueprint Acme which explains why we're seeing the ship on a blue backdrop instead of space, as Commander Keen is using a blueprint to help him navigate the interior of the ship. Ooh, here's a very simple sign with one of the missing characters on it. Now, given that the second word is up, and given that you actually have to ascend in this part of the level to make progress, the first word is clearly go. Thus, we can add the letter G to our list of known characters. We're up to 21. We can also start deciphering a few minor things too. These light switches say on, which is the same thing that these levers next to the Tantalus Ray machines also say. That is why turning them on is a really, really bad idea. Now, the key cards are all lettered A, B, C, and D, and we even have these things, which uh, have one of the missing characters next to a C character. Now, given the only letters still missing are F, J, Q, V, and Z, none of which seem to mix with the C there, I think we're going to have to leave this one for now. Alas, this is the only occurrence of this character in all of Episode 2, so until we visit Episode 3, we're not really going to be able to figure that one out. And there's also a number of minor designations found throughout the ship, which translate to EB, GB, EA, RC, Home B, WA, WB, and Home A. Episode 3 is where things get a little more interesting, as it takes place on the Vortican homeworld. Now right from the start, we're seeing huge signs with wording on them. Now, the first one I ran into has one of the missing characters in it twice. Now if we substitute in a V, we get Vortaville, which kind of sounds like a stereotypical name for a Vortican village or some such, so we'll tentatively go with V for that character. Which actually would make that thing we just saw in Episode 2 read VC on it, whatever that stands for. Actually, above this sign, spelled out in burgers, are the letters TH. No idea why. The other place you can go to from the start has a similar large sign, this time prefaced with the word lower, thus making for lower Vortaville, presuming we got that V right. The next place I visited has a large sign saying new Vorticon. So yeah, I think it's a pretty good sign that we got that V right, but it means we still have no idea what characters represent the F, J, Q, and Z. Oh hey, another big sign mid-level this time. Well, this one says Central Park. Makes sense given the way this area has been designed. Underneath this area is another sign which simply says Subway, which is filled with a bunch of really dangerous fire-breathing enemies and a number of floating vehicles. So not exactly a subway, but I guess that's what passes for one on this planet. Also, the floating vehicles are all conveniently marked Car, just in case you couldn't figure out what they were. 
found another letter we haven't translated yet. Now given the translation as it is, and given that these signs so far have all been the names of the places we're visiting, and given that there's freaking missile silos on this map, I'm gonna guess that's supposed to read Fort Vorticon. Just three letters to go and we'll have this alphabet completely decoded. Now this sign here down in the fort says pool, although personally I think it's a bit too deep and a bit too deadly to be called that. Now this one here says Fort Cavort, which is probably the least on-the-nose name we've had so far. This place is called Fort Vorta Bella. I'm starting to sense a pattern here. This flag has the letters GI on it. I wonder how many people know that GI was originally intended to refer to galvanized iron. I also noticed by this point that the exit doors themselves have writing on them now, which reads, by now. A lot of these maps have places which are kind of themed to be apartment buildings or condos. Now, this place here is called Hal's Kitchen, suggesting that maybe it's a restaurant of some kind. Now, this sign here simply says Beans, spelled with two E's, so I'm guessing that's going to be a proper name of some sort. Although this map here has our first instance of a school on this planet, where the teacher is teaching the students how to translate between the standard galactic alphabet and English, with Kill Keen written out on the blackboard, corrupting the minds of young children with thoughts of murder right from the start. There's probably some kind of political message here, but we should probably just move on. Oh, and you know it's a proper school because it literally says school on the top of the building. This place is called The Bonx, which I'm guessing is a take on The Bronx, and not much further past that, we have a place with, filled with bouncy balls and children called The Nursery. Now this place here is called West Vortaville, which confirms that the Vorticons do use the same cardinal directions we do, and this place is called... wait, Vortaville? We already saw a Vortaville sign, why are we seeing another? This Vortaville, however, has another school, with the word Earth being translated. And we also see the letters GI again on an ominous picture of... Oh, I get it now. GI stands for Grand Intellect, the name given to the antagonist of this entire saga. Well, that makes sense. Here's a sign that reads Valden Park, not far past the school that we just saw. And this sign further ahead says Water, and probably as an indication to go down through the water if you want to actually make progress. The interesting thing here being that the words Earth and Water both share four of their five letters with each other. So this is a sign you could potentially decipher having only paid attention to the Earth translation earlier in the level. This place is apparently called Cape Canavorta. Yet another wordplay thing going on with that name. Well, this level is brutally hard and entirely optional. I did manage to get far enough to, into this to see the sign which reads Barracks, and then later this sign which reads Brig. And I don't think there's any more signs following, but uh, that's actually the last level. I mean, not the actual last level, which is the final boss, but that means we never properly decoded the J, Q, or Z letters. Well, there's one final gambit we can take, which is kind of a long shot. Literally, as it involves a lot of waiting. You've no doubt seen that green sea dragon roaming around the main map of the third episode of Commander Keen. Well, it follows a fairly lengthy path, stopping to nibble on various grasses growing in the ocean. Now, right near the final boss location is a bunch of those grasses, right next to some water you can walk up to. If you're patient, I mean really patient, and wait a considerable amount of time, that sea dragon will make its way there, and Keen can ride it. Then it's another long wait, as said sea dragon makes its way all around the map to arrive at a lone island with a secret level on it. Now, normally, this secret level is just one big labyrinth with scoring items and such to find, but notice there's a gap right at the left side at the start. And there was already a level prior with a secret shortcut hidden away by taking an upper path like that, so it should already be obvious they're going to hide something up there. So if we go up and explore that upper section, we find a school with the entire alphabet decoded already. Well, that just made this entire ordeal pointless. And yeah, given that you have to get up to the final boss to even access this place, I guess it makes sense to wait until the game is at its end to reveal this. But still, it's kind of weird that the letters J, Q, and Z are literally nowhere else in the entire trilogy. You have to learn them from this blackboard here. That or perhaps they're revealed in a manual or such, but I never got a manual for this game, as I originally bought my copy digitally from 3D Realms, which only included the hint sheet, which doesn't have the alphabet listed. Either way, I was still interested in going through this and figuring out the language from scratch, given only the game is my guide. Though recording everything as I went and then cross-referencing it all, 
sped things up considerably. And I kind of wish this alphabet was used to an even greater extent in the game, just to sort of build the lore up more, or heck, even make it so that you could learn the language as you went, and then see it translated on the fly. But that might have been pushing things a bit for a feature which otherwise would serve no purpose other than set dressing. So what we ended up with was still a neat addition all the same. Anywho, that'll be all for this episode of ADG Pro. Next Saturday will be the last ADG mod video of the year, and we're going to be doing some level editing with a game engine composed entirely of cubes. And no, it's not Minecraft. Minecraft doesn't exist for DOS. At least, not yet. And no, it's not going to be Transland either. You're just going to have to stay tuned to see what well-known game just happens to be composed out of a bunch of cubes. Thanks for watching, everyone, and extra special thanks to those of you supporting me on Patreon. Here's just a small random set of you guys.